Okay. So I wanted to record a video of uh, my birth story with my son, Jameson. Um, he was still born at exactly 38 weeks. So um, he died two weeks before his due date. Um, I wanted to record this because mainly I already feel like things get foggy for me um, as time goes on. I want to remember everything in detail. Um, so I want to be able to go back and watch this whenever I want. So I don't have to forget anything. Um, I also want anyone who is wondering about his birth story to, um, to be able to hear that without having to ask me. I mean, I'm okay when people ask me about it, but um, maybe there are people who don't feel comfortable asking. Um, I'm warning you now that I'm going to be really bad at this because I'm horrible at telling stories. Everyone knows that about me. <laughs> I am very long-winded and I like tend to ramble. I'm just going to tell it how I remember. It might be long, so I don't even know where to start. I guess I'll just start from when I found out he had passed away. Um, it was a Saturday morning on March 3rd. And I'm really aware of my body. I'm really in tune with myself. I'm really paranoid about my health, even more so for Jameson's health. And um, the morning that I woke up, it was about 9 a.m. I woke up and like literally immediately when I woke up, um, I felt like a stillness. He was always really active when I was sleeping really active at night before I went to bed, really active in the morning, and typically I'd like wake up and like as soon as I woke up, I could feel him moving. He was extremely active. Um, actually, going back, before, um, before this morning, my whole pregnancy, obviously, my biggest fear ever was having a stillborn. Um, I was way more paranoid about this than most people. I talked about it all the time. Anyone who's remotely close to me has heard me mention at least once during my pregnancy with Jameson that I was terrified of that. Um, there were three specific times during my pregnancy that um, I would tell Tanner, my boyfriend, that I was really worried because I hadn't felt him move in a while or... I felt like something was wrong and Tanner was always super supportive and reassuring and he always told me he was sure everything was fine, that he was just sleeping or that, um, you know, I had been really active that day so maybe I just didn't notice that he was moving and he would always say, let's lay here for a little bit and see if he moves and... You know, if when if you want to go to the doctor, if you want to call the doctor or go to the hospital, I'm totally fine with that too. So he never made me feel like I was crazy. Um, he was always so, totally down <laughs> for whatever I wanted, but was also very reassuring. And um, I remember when I went um, for an ultra a 3D ultrasound when I was 28 weeks. Um, he had moved into three different positions within five minutes. When she was trying to find his face, he was head down, and then all of a sudden he would move, and he was like completely sideways, where his head was like over here in my side. And then by the end of it, he was breech, where his head was up and his feet were down, or no, his feet were up by his face and his butt was down. And she's like, the ultrasound tech was just like saying how active he was. And I remember that specifically worrying me, even though that's typically not something to worry about. I asked her, could he get tangled in his umbilical cord? Is the cord around his neck? Can you tell? And she looked and she told me, no, right now the cord's not around his neck. But, you know, that happens one in four babies. It's not a big deal if it does. He's a very active baby, super healthy, blah, blah, blah. 
but that was always something that worried me. I was worried about everything, I guess. And so um, about a week, the couple weeks before Jameson died, I started feeling like something was seriously wrong. Um, I was having this like extreme pain um, right at the top of my stomach between my rib cage. I thought I was getting diastasis recti, which is something where you like, your center abdominal muscles separate. I went to the doctor. They told me it wasn't that. They weren't sure what it was. They thought maybe I was getting ulcers. No one could explain it. So I still wonder if that had if that was something that was wrong. I don't know, but. Um, I ended up going to the hospital the week he died for that pain. Um, I was having contractions, but it was nothing serious. I wasn't dilated, nothing, so they sent me home. Three days before he died, I went to the hospital again. Um, I thought I was leaking um, amniotic fluid. I also... Um, I don't know. I thought I was leaking amniotic fluid. I, th I just, fe I felt like he wasn't moving as much as he typically did. I felt like something was wrong. So I went to the hospital again, and they even thought by the amount of fluid that was coming out of me randomly when I would just like walk that it was amniotic fluid, but they kept testing it and telling me it wasn't. I wasn't contracting enough. I was barely dilated, so they sent me home. But before they sent me home, they wanted to measure my amniotic fluid just in case I was leaking. So they ordered an ultrasound. And my levels were perfectly fine. I was very hydrated. My amniotic fluid levels were perfect. Everything during my pregnancy was perfect. It was almost unbelievable considering my health issues I've had in the past that my pregnancy was so perfect. Um, so while she was looking for measuring the amniotic fluid with an ultrasound, I said, is the cord around his neck? I just feel like he hasn't been moving a lot in the last couple days. And she said, well, the doctor didn't order me to look at that, so I can't tell you that. And I remember being like, God, I just want to know because that worries me. It always just worried me. Even though that's such a common thing to happen, it worried me. But she wouldn't tell me. She was very, like, cold, how a lot of ER ultrasound techs are. And, um, I mean, they're not cold, but, you know, they can't, they can't tell you anything. And I understand that. Um, so... I went home and that was like on Wednesday or something and so Friday night I was up really late I was at my best friend Emily's house I remember I fell asleep on her couch I was always so tired and I fell asleep with my hand on my belly and he was kicking while I was laying there I left her house at 2 30 in the morning and went home and I got home, got ready for bed. I was laying in bed, it was like three o'clock in the morning. And I laid there until probably 3.30 and he was moving. He wasn't like moving like crazy like he usually does where my whole belly is like moving around, but he was moving and that was comforting to me and I didn't really think anything of it and I went to sleep. So fast forward a few hours, I wake up at nine Immediately, I felt stillness. Um, I felt like my belly was really relaxed. Like there was no, no like tension. I don't know how to explain it, but he was like completely dead weight. And I immediately got worried. This had happened a couple other times in my pregnancy though. So I didn't like immediately panic. Tanner was sleeping next to me. I didn't wake him up or anything. I decided I was going to get up and shower and lay back down. So I got up and I showered. 
and I laid back down. And by then, for sure, Jameson would have been moving, and he wasn't. Then I got a little bit worried. So I got up and went to the kitchen, and I drank cold orange juice. By now, I was nervous. I was shaking a little bit. I just remember I brought the little half gallon of orange juice into the bed with me and I'm laying there in bed pushing my stomach drinking out of this bottle of orange juice and he just didn't move quick enough for me I don't think I waited longer than like five minutes not even five minutes of trying that and I woke Tanner up and I was like Jameson's not moving I haven't felt him move all morning I took a shower I drank orange juice he's not moving and of course, Tanner did the thing that he always does. And he's like, well, I'm sure everything's fine. If you want to go to the hospital, we can. Um, but why don't we try using the Doppler? I had an at-home Doppler, one of those little ultrasound machines that just, you can just hear the heartbeat. Um, and I hated using that because I was always afraid that I wasn't gonna do it right and that I wasn't gonna find a heartbeat um, and then that was gonna freak me out and so I said well not yet I want to lay here a little bit longer and by the way the other two times I used the Doppler during my pregnancy I found his heartbeat right away so I laid there a little bit longer and then I could tell that Tanner was starting to get worried we were both pushing on my stomach and just nothing um, and then all of a sudden we saw like, as I was pushing on my belly, we saw what looked like his like little heel of his foot push up near my rib. And anytime one of his like elbows or feet would push out of my stomach, I would push it back and he would move it. I'd like push on him and he would move and react to my touch. And I remember I pushed on the little bump on my belly, whatever body part that was, pretty sure it was his knee or his foot, and it just stayed there. And at that moment, Tanner and I both looked at each other, and he was like, I think we should try the Doppler, or go to the hospital, one of the two. So I went and got the Doppler out of the closet, and I put it on my stomach where they always put it every time I go to the doctor and there's nothing I started moving it everywhere all around my stomach and it wasn't working and I'm sitting there looking at the machine I'm like is it not turned up is it broken what's going on and I immediately move it from my stomach up to my chest and it picked up my heartbeat immediately and I think at that moment Tanner and I both knew and we're like, yeah, let's go to the hospital like now. So we throw clothes on and we start driving to the hospital. And it was like deadly quiet in the car because we just knew. We didn't want to know though. We didn't want to know for sure. But I mean, we just knew and I'm sitting there as we're driving, I'm like shoving my stomach. I'm like literally basically shaking him in my stomach trying to feel any movement and he just wasn't moving. So we actually drove to the closest hospital which was not the hospital that I was going to give birth at. I was actually planning to give birth at a hospital that was a half hour away from our house because it had um, midwives were um, allowed to deliver there and it had what were called natural birthing suites which was um, a hospital room that was that looked more like a birthing center it had like a queen bed instead of a hospital bed there was no medical equipment in the room and it was meant for it was meant only for women who were planning on having um, unmedicated births so there was like a big birthing tub that was big enough for me and Tanner and there was also a jacuzzi tub in the bathroom so anyways um, we drove to the closest hospital to our house which was about 
probably less than 10 minutes away. And we rush up to the maternity floor and I just walked up and I said, I haven't felt my baby move since last night to the woman at the desk and she asked for my name and within like five seconds she rang an alarm that was ringing through the whole floor saying code red, I don't know what it said. It was stating that there was an emergency which immediately made me scared. Um, and they rushed me into a room within 30 seconds of me being there and within one to two minutes there was an ultrasound tech in the room with me and they were throwing on um, monitors on my stomach and immediately there was no heartbeat with the monitor which there always was before every single time I got that I already knew and they started to give me an ultrasound I could see on the ultrasound his ribs I could see the little ventricles of his heart and it wasn't beating they didn't have to tell me and they're just sitting there looking for probably two to three minutes and um, I just remember staring straight forward event like every now and then I would look over at Tanner and he was just staring back at me with this horrified look on his face and they called the doctor in and and she looked at the ultrasound for about 30 seconds and she just looked at me she had so much sympathy in her eyes <laughs> and she said I'm so sorry but I think you're experiencing a stillbirth and Tanner started to cry and I had zero emotion because I was so mad and I just kept staring off I kept staring off into the distance I couldn't even look at anyone or talk to anyone and they kept trying to talk to me and they're trying to figure out what I wanted to do and I didn't care <laughs> and they kept asking me if I was okay and I kept saying I'm fine I just want to leave and they kept asking me if I wanted to have him there at that hospital or if I wanted to go to the hospital where I was planning to have him and I said I just want to leave I'm leaving I don't care and they kept saying are you okay and I'm like yes I'm fine don't ask me anymore I don't care I was so mad and they finally left they wanted to give me and Tanner some time alone so all of the nurses and the doctor left the room and the first thing I said to him after they left the room I just kept looking around the room thinking that I'm having one of my terrible dreams and it's so realistic right now but when I wake up I'm going to quickly realize that I was dreaming and then I'm going to be so relieved and I asked Tanner I said am I dreaming and he said no and I was like yes I am I know I am I just have to wake up and he's like you're not dreaming and I just couldn't believe that that was my reality and it almost felt like I was in a dreamlike 
a dreamlike state because it was just so surreal and so we started making phone calls Tanner immediately I think called his brother or no he called his mom and I called my best friend Emily who was gonna be my doula and <laughs> I remember I called her and she was with her mom and you know I didn't call her crying or anything I hadn't even started crying yet and I didn't want to blindside her if she had her kids or if she was doing in the middle of something so she answered and I was like hey what are you doing <laughs> casually and she said oh I'm just driving with my mom why what's up and I said uh, Jameson's dead and the phone cut off apparently and so she didn't hear me say anything and she's like what are you doing today like do you want to hang out later or she said something like that and I was like Emily did you just hear what I did you hear what I said she said oh no sorry I must have cut out what'd you say <laughs> and I was like Jameson's dead and she was silent for a second and was just like what and I was like, he's dead, he doesn't have a heartbeat. I'm at the hospital right now. And she said, what hospital? I'm gonna, I'm gonna be there right, I'm coming right now. And so I told her and I hung up the phone. Um, she got there within like five minutes and I told her that her mom could come in and her mom is a really good friend of mine as well. And she's also a midwife. So I wanted her there and sorry, let me get a tissue. Okay. So they got there. I told them I wanted to go home and pack a bag and go to the hospital that we plan on having him at. So they, dr they dr drove us home. Um, Emily dr drove my car and they dropped us off and they just waited outside and gave, told us that we could take all the time that we wanted and that they would drive us to the hospital whenever we were ready, not to rush. And actually they didn't wait outside, they actually went to Target and they went and bought me like all these things that I was gonna need. They bought me a blanket and slippers and things for my postpartum care. They're like the nicest people I've ever met. And so Tanner and I got home and I just laid in bed for a while. And Tanner played guitar. He was playing the songs that Jameson always liked hearing. He would always move around in me a lot um, when Tanner would play guitar right next to my belly. And we just kind of laid there for a while for the last time. And then I packed a bag and all I packed was like five outfits. I was kind of delusional and thought that I'd be able to kind of dress him up in a bunch of different outfits and take pictures of him in a bunch of my favorite outfits, which was unrealistic. I packed, you know, those five outfits. And then I packed one outfit change for me and then I put on my birthing outfit which was a little nightgown with a matching robe um I don't really think I brought anything else just clothes and our toothbrushes I don't even know if I brought that I can't remember um and I started to get anxious and I just wanted him out of me at that point because I am also a doula and I know I have watched videos on still on stillbirths before just to educate myself and I know that sometimes the longer that the baby is inside of you they can start to deteriorate um, not always but it does happen sometimes and I was really worried about that and I just wanted him to look perfect. 
so I started to get anxious and we went to the hospital. Um, when we got there, they um, gave me a medication, I can't remember what it was, but they gave me something to start my dilation. It wasn't really working. I wasn't getting contractions, so they inserted a balloon up my cervix, which they stick it up your cervix, they fill it with water, and then it's attached to like a little tube that comes out of you and you like pull on it and if and like the fill the they fill it with water or salt saline whatever and the more you pull on the tube the more the balloon comes out and it forces you to dilate to about a five <clears throat> and so they put that in me and that went really smoothly and worked exactly how they wanted it to but nothing was progressing so they started me on Pitocin. Now I quickly decided, I had always wanted to have a unmedicated birth and I had quickly decided that um, I no longer wanted that. I was in too much emotional pain. I didn't want to feel an, an ounce of, of physical pain. And so, um, I said, I'm gonna want an epidural as soon as possible. Not yet, because I wanna be able to feel that I'm having contractions and I, and I want to be able to walk around and sit on a medicine ball doing whatever I need to do to um, help him come down and basically minimize the time that my labor was gonna be. But as soon as I started being too uncomfortable, I wanted an epidural. Now, this was something that I had struggled with my entire pregnancy because if you don't know me, I have had multiple back surgeries. Um, I've had severe scoliosis my whole life. I had a surgery to have my spine fused with metal rods. I had a second surgery to have the rods revised and the infection got into, bacteria got into my spine during that second surgery, which caused tons of problems for me, <laughs> tons of problems for me. And I ended up having to have emergency surgery, taking everything out. However, my spine is still fused. I still have slight scoliosis. So my whole pregnancy, I was worried that Sorry, my dogs heard something. I'm just gonna talk over them. Hold on. Anyways, I pretty much knew that was gonna happen at some point during this video. So, um, during my whole pregnancy, I was really worried about the fact that um, there's a possibility with every birth that you could have to have a cesarean. And I was worried that because of my back issues that they weren't going to be able to give me an epidural or a spinal. And I was reassured my entire pregnancy that the anesthesiologists at this hospital were very skilled and they've done plenty of epidurals on women who have had spinal fusion and scoliosis. I offered to give them x-rays of my back. I offered to go in and see them before my birth. They always said, no, 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 we don't need that. We're very skilled, it's fine. So I was reassured that it was fine. The anesthesiologist even came into um, the hospital room and reassured me that it was gonna be fine and that he's given epidurals to plenty of women with scoliosis and spinal fusion and asked me if I wanted it yet. And I said, no, not yet, I'll call you and I do. So finally I was like, I was um, listening to my hypnobirthing um, recordings and I wasn't even in that much pain yet, but I was starting to be in pain and I realized that I no longer wanted to walk around like I thought I would because I realized that there would be other mothers walking around the hospital rooms or the hospital halls who were in labor with their babies I didn't want anyone to ask me anything about my baby. Um, I didn't want anyone to congratulate me. I didn't want 
any of that, so I decided I didn't want to walk around anymore. So I decided to call for the anesthesiologist, and um, he came in, prepped me, numbed me. You know, getting numbed, I think, is the most painful part because the lidocaine stings, and it was nothing for me with all of the back issues I've had. Seriously, it was not a big deal. And um, he stuck the needle in once and immediately said, nope, that's not it. Took it out. Stuck it in a second time. Wow, your spine's a lot further over than I thought it was. Took it out. And then he asked me, so do you want me to keep going? <laughs> and I was like, uh, yes, if you're confident um, that you're not going to damage me, then yes, I would very much like you to keep going because you're not bothering me by sticking me a bunch of times. I just don't want to feel anything. I don't want to be in pain anymore. I want to be able to just rest and have this be as least traumatic as possible. Because for me, having an unmedicated birth would not be traumatic. It would I, it wouldn't be traumatic at all if I was having, if I was doing the best thing I could that I think is best for my son and, um, and I just wanted to experience everything and then have this reward for experiencing all of that. And I wasn't going to have that reward anymore. Um, there was no point to me anymore to do it unmedicated so he stuck me again and again failed and he said I could try it again but I'm worried that I'm gonna puncture one of your organs and I'm like what what are you talking about and and he's like I'm afraid I'm gonna puncture one of your kidneys I'm like my spine is not that far over to the left or right but if you're worried about that and you think that that's going to happen, like, obviously don't keep going. And he's like, well, I'm not sure if that's going to happen. And I asked him, have you done that already? And he said, oh, my gosh, I, I don't even go into everything he said to me. But basically, he told me he wasn't sure if he had punctured my organs already that we would find out later when I go into organ failure. <laughs> he was pretty sure he hadn't, but... He's just worried that he might if he keeps trying. Um, but I let him try one more time because I was desperate and I just didn't care. I really just didn't really care about my health anymore. I was just like, I don't want to do this anymore. And he tried again for the fourth time and failed. And at that point, I am so triggered and so upset because I had dealt with so much in my life where I failed at things that I wanted so badly because of my back issues. Basically every doctor that's ever seen me doesn't know how to handle me. I'm somehow different than the rest and everything's always a mystery. <laughs> so it was no surprise to me that this happened. And so, um, I said, well, when the next anesthesiologist is on shift, is, is, when the next anesthesiologist comes in, I want him to try. So the guy left. And at this point, I'm like, someone give me pain med medicine or something, because I was just so upset and in so much pain, and I didn't want to do it anymore. Long story short, the only pain medication that would have remotely helped my pain, they were out of. They had, apparently there's a national shortage of pain medication, so they gave me something else that literally didn't even touch my pain. I have a very high tolerance from all the medical stuff that's happened to me in the past. What they gave me did not help. So I tried to rest and I tried to sleep before things progressed further. And they did have me on pain medication that to me wasn't helping. Maybe it was, but it did not feel like it was. And 
um, because I was on this pain medication, they sent in a respital, uh, respiratory, why can't I say the word? They sent in a respiratory therapist, <laughs> sorry. And um, he came in super loud, did not care that I was sleeping. I don't even know if he paid attention to the fact that I was going through some serious stuff and that I was having a stillborn. I don't know, but he came in acting like nothing was going on and he slapped a big plastic thing around my face that was gonna measure my oxygen levels and just woke me up by slapping this thing on my face, was not gentle. And he, he was like, sorry, I had to put this on your face to measure your oxygen levels. And I was like, okay, well, how long do I have to have this? And he said, oh, for the rest of the time that you're on pain medication, the rest, the rest of the time you're here, basically. And this thing was so bulky. I was like, no. And I ripped it off my face and threw it. And I was like, take me off the pain medication. I'm not wearing that. Forget it. I don't even care. It's not even helping me. And I completely lost it. Probably the worst emotional breakdown I've ever had in my life. And that was at that point, that was like the first time I started sobbing and really let go. And I mean, I lost it. And I was like hyperventilating, screaming, sobbing. I think everything at that point just hit me all at once. Maybe I wasn't in shock anymore, I don't know. And um, at that point, the people who were with me this whole time was Tanner, Emily, and her mom, Carol. And Carol is an exceptional midwife. She is um, very experienced and professional, so having her there really just saved the whole situation from being a lot worse. She helped me so much, and I'm so grateful. And she went out and got the midwife that um, had just gotten there, and she came in, and I have no idea why still, and I think it was kind of an inappropriate time but she came in and while I'm sitting there sobbing and freaking out she's like you know what we just need to get things going now we can't wait any longer I'm gonna I'm gonna pop your water break your water whatever and in the middle of my full-blown mental breakdown sobbing freaking out she starts to break my water, which was the most traumatic part of my entire labor was her doing that because I just couldn't believe that she wouldn't just wait. And I'm sure there is a good reason, but it was not a good time. So she breaks my water and I don't know why that was so traumatic for me, but I think it was the fact that that was the little home that Jameson was in and she's just breaking it and I knew that he was gonna come now and I also was afraid that after my water was broken that it was going to hurt more <clears throat> some people for some people it does there's no cushion there anymore and that's when things you know they upped my pitocin now my water is broken and that's when things started to get really intense and I don't know at what point that happened. The timeline is really weird for me, but my labor was 30 hours long with no epidural, nothing. And um, I was in and out of the tub. The tub really helped me. I basically had three people at all times pushing on my hips, my knees, my back. I had so much back pain. I'm sure that my back pain was just 10 times more than usual back labor because of my back injuries and my surgeries in the past and just the fact that my almost my entire spine is fused solid and cannot move. So painful, really traumatic I, looking back and um, 
after 30 hours of labor, it was finally time for me to have him. One thing I don't like about hospital births is that you are not allowed to give birth in the tub. So they got me out and I went to the bed and I pushed for two hours until I had him. And I, my back hurt so bad I can't even explain. That was the worst part of everything. My back hurt so bad that I honestly can't even remember the pain of him coming out because it literally just felt like my spine was breaking in half. And I was probably the most dramatic person ever <laughs> wow. while pushing him out. I feel like the whole floor probably heard me screaming. And as soon as he came out, they asked me if they, I wanted him directly to my chest and I said yes. And as soon as he hit my chest, I didn't even remember saying this. Emily told me, you know, weeks following my birth, but I kept, I was just staring at him and I kept looking at him and looking up at Tanner and I was just in disbelief. I had no idea he was gonna look like that. He had a full head of dark brown hair, curly hair, just like Tanner. And he was just so perfect looking. And I just kept saying, my baby, this is my baby so perfect I just kept saying my baby my baby over and over and I looked at Emily like directly after he I just he just came out of me and I said I would do this all again and something that I didn't say earlier is that um, I begged for a cesarean because I just wanted them to put me out and cut him out of me because I was in so much pain and I was just emotionally hurting. I didn't want to be going through that anymore. So almost my entire labor I was begging for a cesarean and they did not want to give me one because there was no risk to baby and there would have been higher risks for me to have a cesarean so they really were pushing to not do that. Um, and the second he came out of me, I was so glad that I didn't. Um, and then I went to birth my placenta. And we already knew that I was a bleeder just from my past surgeries. And I had been on at baby aspirin my whole pregnancy. And so they knew that I was most likely going to hemorrhage some. But for some reason, no one was ready for it. And I'm sitting there holding Jameson on my chest and I birth my placenta and immediately start hemorrhaging so bad. Also probably had to do with the fact that my uterus was so exhausted from the 30 hour labor and um, wasn't contracting back. That's what happens after you give birth, your, your uterus starts to contract again and get smaller and that's what stops your bleeding and it wasn't doing that. So immediately um, Carol starts to, even though she doesn't work in that hospital, she's a midwife and she knows what to do in that situation and she just happened to be the one right next to me. So. Carol starts pushing down on my stomach and trying to contract my uterus manually with her hands while she's waiting for everyone else to get the medication that they needed to stop my bleeding. And nothing was stopping it. And it started to get really hectic. And I wanted to help myself. And so I remember just picking Jameson up and handing him to Tanner and I'm like, take him and I basically like, threw him at Tanner and Carol was yelling at people and <laughs> because she was getting nervous and rightfully so there was blood literally everywhere and I remember her face I just kind of stopped in the moment everything kind of went slow-mo and I started thinking to myself, oh my gosh, like, it's a possibility that I could die right now. There was no one getting me my medication fast enough. And 
there was this fear on Carol's face. She tries to not show her emotion, but I can read her like a book. <laughs> and she looked scared. She looked really worried. And I just told her, I said, Carol, she looked at me while she was sitting there like with all her weight on top of me. And I said, it's okay. And she kind of laughed at that afterwards because she thought I was comforting her in that time, but really, it's not that I was saying it's okay. Um, like everything's gonna be fine, don't worry. I'm not bleeding out or anything, it's chill. What I kind of meant was, it's fine. Like, if no one gets me medication fast enough and I hemorrhage and die right here then it's okay <laughs> because I had my baby and I was just okay with whatever happened okay sorry my camera died at the perfect moment because I was starting to lose it so yeah I told Carol that it was okay I was completely at peace. <laughs> I didn't care. And that's when they started popping out the suppository pills. They had turned up my Pitocin. They popped out, I think, eight suppository pills that needed to, you know, where suppositories go. Um, maybe you don't, they go up your butt. <laughs> <laughs> but um, they were popping them out one by one and Tanner and I were both screaming at this girl for not moving fast enough. I actually felt bad about that afterward. We're literally screaming at her. And I said, just hand them to me. And she started handing them to me one by one and I put them up myself. Um, that's the kind of person I am. I like to handle things myself and be in control. Plus, I did not want anyone doing that. After everything that had just gone on, I wanted to do it myself. Um, so, everything went pretty quickly after that. Everything went perfect. Um, I didn't have an epidural, nothing. So, I was able to get up and start moving pretty quickly. And after they got me all situated and I wasn't bleeding anymore, I said, I want to move to the natural, the natural um, birthing room which I wasn't allowed to be in um, just because I was a little, they wanted to monitor, monitor me more since I was having a stillborn. So they moved us into the um, natural birthing suite and Tanner's um, best friend Robert came and took pictures of us and Jameson, which I am going to cherish for the rest of my life and thank you Robert again I thank you a million times I cannot thank you enough for that um, but we didn't have anyone else come we didn't we knew we were gonna have limited time with Jameson and we didn't want a bunch of family coming and being super emotional making things more emotional for us we didn't want to pass him around one thing looking back on that I regret is I was so afraid to handle Jameson. If you don't know, which I actually did not know as much as I educated myself on stillborns way before I even got pregnant or any of this happened, um, their skin is really delicate. Um, I think it has to do with the circulation, but you know, just like they get really bright red lips from the, having no circulation, their skin gets really delicate and can tear and I didn't want his skin to tear. I already had two spots where it had torn. I wanted him to stay looking perfect. That was like really important to me. And, um, and so I was, I didn't want to pass him around. I was scared to, I was scared to handle him. Um, they get, wanted to give him a bath. I, they asked me if I wanted to give him a bath. I didn't. Um, and I actually had the nurses put him in his only outfit. Um, I didn't get to change him a bunch because of his skin. Um, 
but I had the nurses put him in his clothes because I was if I would have torn his skin I would have been so upset and they did tear his skin a little bit on his foot which bothered me but I know it wasn't their fault um, but as something that I super regret is that I didn't spend like any skin to skin time with him. I constantly had him wrapped in a blanket because I didn't want to tear his skin. And I didn't ever look at his butt. I love baby butts. And I never like picked him. I know I didn't study his body enough. I just wanted him clothed and I didn't want to deal with the fact that he was so fragile and I didn't want to mess him up. And I regret that now. I would have changed that if I could go back. Um, but everyone left our room about, I had him at 10, 15, and by the time everything was cleaned up, we moved into another room where we had a regular like queen size bed. We had pictures taken, we cleaned him up, put him in some clothes. Everyone was gone around 4.30, 4 o'clock in the morning, and and I was so exhausted. We were both, we've both been up for two days straight now, basically what it felt like. And um, so we slept in bed together. That was what the amazing thing was about the natural birthing suite is that you could sleep in a regular bed together. And we slept with Jameson between us bundled up. And it was the most peaceful sleep I have ever gotten probably because it was probably the most exhausted I have ever been, but just having him there between us was heaven. Um, we woke up about nine o'clock and no one had disturbed us those few hours sleeping. And another thing that I didn't know about stillborns that happens frequently um, is that they get bloody noses, something to do with the circulation again. So when we woke up, he had been bleeding from his nose. <sighs> that sucked. So we cleaned him up. We spent the morning waiting for me to get, um, another shot. Um, I had to get a Rogam shot because of my blood type. And we left at like 1.30 that day. We spent 15 hours with him and um, when we went to leave, um, we asked my original midwife who was not there for the birth, who had dealt, she was my main midwife through my whole pregnancy. She came in and sweetest woman and she just apologized and cried with us and um, we asked that she after we leave would take Jameson from our room and take him to the morgue. We didn't want some like random person doing it and she said of course and that she'd be honored to. And the last 10 minutes before we left we just laid on, on the bed with him and Tanner played his guitar which is in the first video that I posted on this YouTube channel and um, we laid him in his bassinet I took one more picture of him, which is now my all-time favorite picture of him, and we walked out and left him there, and that is the last time that we saw our son. Um, two days later, the funeral home offered to let us come see him again before they cremated him, but we said no. Um, we just didn't want to see him decomposing or looking any different than how perfect he looked so that's my birth story I rambled and my camera died and a bunch of weird things happened and this is probably going to end up being way too long but that is my birth story and it sucks but I would do it all again just to have those 15 hours with him. And I would not have been able to get through that without Tanner and without Emily and Carol. They were so good to me and so supportive and comforting. 
and the weeks following, they were so perfect too. And I'm just so thankful for them for that. And my birth wasn't perfect and it was traumatic and painful, but it brought me my son and I thought that that wasn't going to be a reward considering he wasn't alive. But it was the best day of my life and the worst day of my life all at the same time. So that's it. Thanks for listening to all of that if you took the time to listen. And if you have any questions, you can definitely ask me. I like talking about it and I'm clearly an open book if you haven't been able to tell. So thanks.